what better way to start a new series than to start it with a blast? For so long, I've been contemplating this idea on how I'm going to help you people once you're done with medical school and you're aiming to get your license with the Health Professions Council of Zambia. There has been some recent news that everyone's going to be taking the exam very, very soon. So I decided to put together this new series on my channel, which is known as the Atomic Bomb. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Hello and welcome to The Atomic Bomb Season 1, Episode 1. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at four chapters, five viva questions that prepare you for the HPCZ licensure exams. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Spread the word of this new series that's coming on the channel and tell a friend to tell a friend to subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to receive notifications of such amazing content every time I post and feel free to pause the video at any time before I display the answer on your screen. I will give you some time for that and let's jump right in. So it's going to be divided into predominantly four chapters. So the first chapter that we're going to look at is internal medicine, chapter one. I know this looks rather dramatic, but I wanted it to be dramatic, kind of like a movie in four different chapters. So our first station is this, or first question rather. Alcohol is a very common problem in Zambia. So what is alcoholism? The most alcoholic uh, patients present with confusion. What other conditions present with confusion? How would you manage alcohol withdrawal syndrome? Why is thiamine given first? Why is hypoglycemia common in alcoholics? So this is in a setting where you're in a viva-based set up where they're asking you these different questions and you expect it to answer. So you may pause the video at this moment, just say your proposed answers to the screen, scream them down, write them down somewhere. I will give you the answer in the next slide. And here we go. So alcoholism is just pretty much excessive, repetitive drinking of alcoholic beverages to an extent that the drinker rep repetitively harms themselves or is a harm to others. So you can also define it as drinking alcohol that results in significant me mental and physical problems. So it actually interrupts their day-to-day -day living. So most of the other things that may present with confusions, you can group them as metabolic. And even when you're answering your questions in a viva, whatever you say may lead to a next question. So these questions tend to build up on each other. So whenever you're asked to talk about lists, or conditions, find a way in which you can classify them. So these can be classified as metabolic, alcohol withdrawal itself, uremia, hepatic encephalopathy, metabolic disturbances such as hypoglycemia, magnesium, calcium, hypoxia, vitamin B12 deficiency, thiamine deficiencies. It may also be due to infectious causes like CNS opportunistic infections, meningoencephalitis, sepsis, and even syphilis. You may have some Toxins such as recreational drug abuse, alcohol intoxication, alcohol withdrawal syndrome. You may have carbon monoxide poisoning, lead and mercury poisoning. Or you may have vascular causes like hypertensive emergency, that's your hypertensive encephalopathy. You may also have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So how exactly do we manage an alcohol withdrawal sy syndrome? We pretty much want to admit the patient, keep them in a safe place where they can't harm themselves. We want to correct the electrolyte abnormalities. We correct the dehydration that is there. So if they need IV fluids or they're dehydrated, give them IV fluids. We want to treat any infections that may be there. So if there are signs of fevers, there's a derangement in the full blood count, you want to give this person intravenous antibiotics. If you do not have facilities to actually check the blood glucose, we assume that the alcoholics are hypoglycemic. As I always say, hypoglycemia will kill a patient much faster than hyperglycemia. So you want to treat any hypoglycemia with 30 mils of 50% dextrose, thereafter give them a dextrose infusion. We want to also give them parenteral thiamine, 250 milligrams daily. You can give this as an intramuscular injection, three to five days. Give them also some B-complex. This is supposed to be 20 mils, not 250. It's supposed to be 20 mils in about 250 mils of D10. So you may also give them diazepam. This is the regimen for the alcoholic withdrawal. So 10 milligrams every six hours for four doses. 
then five milligrams every six hours for eight doses. So the reason why we give thiamine as well is that we want to prevent further exacerbation of any B1 deficiency in alcoholics because this can actually trigger them going into a Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. And the reason why hypoglycemic uh, episodes are very common in alcoholics, number one, is that remember that alcohol is going to be inducing glycogenolysis. So there's going to be an increase in glucose levels. However, the alcoholics are not going to drink, eat well when they're drinking. That's the, the first and foremost thing. Most of them are just going to be having these meat chops that they're going to be eating and it's, it's not really a well-balanced diet. And then, of course, it's also due to extensive damage of the liver. So the metabolism of glucose is not as efficient as in a normal person. So th these are some of the reasons why alcoholics usually tend to present with hypoglycemia. Moving on to the additional information that you may be asked, you should know how to calculate units of alcohol. So this is how you calculate it. So you say the total volume of the alcohol multiplied by the percentage, divide this by a thousand. So for example, to work out the units in uh, a pint, which is about 568 mils of a strong lager, which is 5.2%. So you say 5.2 multiplied by 568 divided by a thousand. So this is about 2.95 units if you take one pint of this beverage. So remember that we consider binge drinking as drinking more than five, five or more units for men and four or more units for women on any given occasion. We call that as binge drinking. Moving on to the second question. A patient that recently traveled from the Copper Belt to Lusaka presents with lightheadedness, headache, joint pain, significant pala, you decide to order an FBC and discover an HB of 2. Further investigation reveals a positive RDT malaria test. How would you manage this patient step by step in full? So you may pause the video at this moment. So let me just give you a background. This is someone that has traveled from the Copper Belt coming to Lusaka and they have had a positive malaria test. HB is 2. So already in the back of your mind, this person has severe anemia. What can tie in, what diagnosis can tie in severe anemia together with malaria? So this person most likely has severe malaria, obviously with the complication of severe anemia. So they're just simply asking you, how are you going to manage this severe case of malaria? So you generally want to admit the patient, obviously. You gain your venous axis, you collect blood for a thick and a thin smear, also collect blood for a cross match. Check for blood glucose. If you don't have facilities to uh, check the blood glucose, assume they're hypoglycemic. So give them the 30 mils or 50% dextrose and cover them on a dextrose infusion. Most malaria patients, especially those that are being treated using quinine, if you don't have a tessinate, there is a risk of hypoglycemia. So make sure that the fluids that you're adding on the chart also do have some glucose to them, or dextrose rather. So if the patient has a fever, you may give them paracetamol. If the patient is in shock, correct the fluid imbalance, but this person needs a transfusion. So we want to transfuse four units of packed cells. The reason why we're giving packed cells is this person has a very low HB. So once we give them whole blood, it may lead the heart to decompensate and they may get into heart failure. So we give four units of blood over four hours, and then we monitor the features of, if there are any features of fluid overload, and make sure that you should also give them a stat dose of furosemide, one milligram per kg IV before the transfusion to prevent any fluid overload. The reason why we're giving four units is remember each unit of blood is going to raise your HB by at least one milligram per deciliter. So if we are at two, that means if we give four, we're at six. So six is um, very close to a patient actually being stable. Then we want to cover them on IV at 2.4 mili mil milligrams per kg at 0, 12, 24. These doses are always fixed. And if the patient improves, or if the patient doesn't improve, rather we continue at the same dosage once a day. Until they improve, you should give the maximum of uh, about a week. And after they improve, you transition them to the coatum, which are going to be giving its four tablets twice a day for three days. So it's given at 0, 8, 24, 36, 48, and 60 hours. Then treat any other complications for severe malaria. Then we recheck the HB after 48 hours of the transfusion. Give them some uh, 5 milligrams of uh, ferrous sulfate orally, OD, and repeat the MPS after the treatment period. Generally, when they are asymptomatic or their HB is greater than 7, you may actually discharge them from the ICU because ideally these patients may be managed in the ICU. Then once they recover, you discharge them and you send them home on ferrous sulfate and folic acid. Of course... If they have an HB of 2, you would also want to do other further investigations to 
determine the underlying cause of this. So you can do some peripheral blood smears. You may do some stool or coat blood tests. You may also do some endoscopic and colonoscopic studies to determine the cause of the HB being 2 because you may find out that the malaria may be an incidental cause and may not really be the cause that has the HB of 2, but malaria does indeed cause an HB of 2 in some cases. So remember, like I said, one unit of blood raises the blood by one gram per deciliter and the hematocrit by 3%. So ideally, we give Paxils as opposed to whole blood in severely anemic patients to prevent them from going into heart failure. And here's a schematic, or rather a table, with the different complications of severe malaria and how they are managed in brief. So you may pause the video at this time, have a look at this information, it will help you uh, and it's quite summarized. It'll give you an idea of the different complications that you can be asked in a possible malaria viable question. Moving on to question three, after the patient recovers from malaria, what do they feel? What are the post-malaria complications? Take note that most people here are going to confuse the complications of malaria with post-malaria complications. That, they're not the same thing. Complications of malaria are those 10 things that we talk about. Cerebro edema, they've now added more of the complications. Cerebro edema, pulmonary edema, blackwater fever, algid malaria, so on and so forth. Those are complications of uh, severe features or rather complications of malaria. Now, post-malaria complications are the complications after you, you get the treatment or whatever, the malaria has been cleared. There are other complications that can arise from that. Most people tend to overlook these. So here's the answer. So you may have what is known as a post-malaria neurological syndrome. So this is actually a quite rare but self-limiting neurological complication. And usually it's going to be occurring after this patient has had severe falciparum infection and they've recovered. So they're going to be have being a numerous number of symptoms, neuropsychiatric symptoms, that are going to be including mild neurologic deficits to sometimes even severe encephalopathy. Then the syndromes can actually include a delayed or even acute disseminated in disseminated encephalomyelitis, it may be delayed cerebellar ataxia, you may have acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathies, and this usually can develop two months after the clearance of the parasitemia, but most severe cases actually do benefit from steroid therapy. So the symptoms are going to be including things like acute confusion, seizures, motor aphasia, generalized myoclonus, you may have postural tremors, you may have cerebellar ataxia, fever, speech abnormalities, tremors, Behavioral abnormalities, impaired consciousness, you may have headaches, you may have psychosis, catatonia, hallucinations, you may have weakness, dizziness, you may have midriasis, you may have nystagmus, paraplegia, and even somnolence. Coming to our question four, we're almost done with chapter one. So you find an unconscious diabetic patient and have no glucometer. What do you give and why? So take note that this one is not just any other patient. It's a diabetic patient. You don't have a glucometer, what are you going to do? You may pause the video. This is actually a, a, a trick question. You may think it's very easy to actually answer this question, but you may actually easily fall into a trap. There are some people that are going to say that we do not give glucose because they are diabetic. There are some people that are going to say that we give glucose for some, for some, for whatever reason. So you may pause the video at this moment, and here comes the answer. So. If you don't have a glucometer, like I said, you're safer off giving them the glucose. Why do I say so? It's because, number one, if this person has hypoglycemia, patients that are diabetic tend to develop hypoglycemia in minutes to hours. This is one of the things that can cause them to be unconscious. And remember that this hypoglycemia that's developing in minutes to hours can actually cause damage to the neurons. So it means that hypoglycemia is one of the complications of DM. It could be as a result of an overdose of the drugs that they're taking or maybe the activity that we're doing. They took the insulin and didn't eat. They took the insulin and had vigorous exercise that tipped them into hypoglycemia. Then when you talk about DKA, which can increase the blood glucose level, this one tends to develop over hours and days and it's often due to osmotic shifts of fluid, ketone bodies being made and these patients also are in shock. Then when you talk about hyperglycemic, hyper smaller state, this usually develops over weeks and it's due to osmotic shifts and the shock. So remember that in DKA and HHS, the blood glucose is already high. So even if you give extra glucose, it's not necessarily going to cause more harm to the patient as opposed to depriving someone who's hypoglycemic glucose, which will cause significant 
neuron damage, which is going to be reversible. So we always assume that patients are hypoglycemic as this is actually it's going to save their lives. Hypoglycemia will kill you much faster than hyperglycemia. Coming to the last question in the chapter one, what is pneumonia? How do you classify pneumonia? Why is epidemiological classification of pneumonia important? What is the management of severe pneumonia? Management, what is the management of PCP, which is now pneumocystis gerveci pneumonia? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So remember that pneumonia is an acute inflammation of the lung parenchyma distal to the terminal bronchioles. So this includes the bronchioles themselves, the alveolar ducts, the alveolar spaces, and the interstitial tissue. Often I hear a lot of people saying this is infection and inflammation. It's not always infection. You may sometimes have some non-infectious causes of pneumonia. So pneumonia is pretty much, in strict speaking, an inflammation of the lung parenchyma, distal to the terminal bronchioles. Then we can classify it epidemiologically, where we have the community-acquired pneumonia versus hospital-acquired pneumonia. Etiologically, where we have infectious, which could be bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic, versus non-infectious. You may have anatomical, depending on whatever is being affected, the lobar pneumonia, the lobular pneumonia, or the segmental pneumonia, interstitial and bronchopneumonia. Then the reason why epidemiological classification is important because it will give you a good indication of the causative agent as they differ. We have different causes of community-acquired pneumonia, predominant causes. We have different predominant causes of hospital-acquired pneumonia. Then the management of severe pneumonia is going to include admission to ICU, preferably. Give them broad-spectrum antibiotics, your penicillins or your cephalosporins as IV. Oxygen therapy is very important. Fluids. Make sure that you match the fluid to their urine output. So you remember that your normal urine output is 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg per hour. Then DVT prophylaxis, so you can cover them on your low molecular weight heparin. Nutritional support, antipyretics and analgesia. Also chest physio. Generally, how we manage PCP, we do the general management as above. We admit them to the ICU, oxygen therapy, cover them on, on antibiotics, cover them on a thromboprophylaxis, give them IV fluids, chest physio. But in addition to that, we want to give them septrin. So we give them septrin for 21 days along with the steroid, high-dose septrin. Alternatively, if they react to septrin, you can give them dapson, plus or minus perimethamine, or you can give them pentamidine nebulizers or advaquan whatever you have in the hospital. And remember that coarse crepitations or crackles are going to be associated with bronchiectasis or resolving pneumonia, whereas the fine crackles are going to be heard either in pulmonary edema or interstitial fibrosis. This is very important because when you hear and you auscultate the chest of a patient with a suspected pneumonia or suspected bronchiectasis, if you're hearing coarse crepitations, then it may point you towards that direction. But if they're fine, then it may be due to pulmonary edema or interstitial fibrosis. Then remember the CURB65, which is a scoring system to help you score the severity. So each score is given a score out of one. Confusion, if there is confusion, one. If the urea is greater than seven, one. If the respiratory rate is greater than 30, one. If the BP is less than 90 systolic blood pressure, you give them one. And if the age is above 65, you give them one. So you score this out of five. The maximum score you can get is five. The lowest score you can get, of course, is zero. So someone who has three and above, they should be admitted and treated in ICU. If they are between uh, two to three, then you can actually treat them as hospital on the general wards. And then if it's one and below, you can treat them as an outpatient. So that's all on the IMED chapter. I really hope you enjoyed that bit. Now we move on to chapter two, which is surgery. So question one, blood transfusions are very common on our wards and patients need them every day. What are some of the indications of blood transfusion do you know? What do you do when giving a blood transfusion? What is done in the blood bank to ensure the new blood they get is called safe? These are very, very practical questions because we deal with this each and every single day on the hospital. You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So blood transfusions can be used preoperatively, intraoperatively, postoperatively due to blood loss. Anything that can cause blood loss in any of these states, you may be indicated to use a blood transfusion. In severe anemia, we do give blood transfusions. In symptomatic moderate anemias, we do 
transfuse in trauma patients, we do transfuse in patients in hemorrhagic shock, we do transfuse in patients with sepsis, we do transfuse. Then what do you check for when giving a blood transfusion? So there's a blood transfusion checklist that you should actually have a look at. So first of all is the patient details. So you want to ensure the patient's name, the patient's blood group, the indication for the transfusion, any previous transfusions that they received, and if they have any previous uh, transfusion reactions. Then the other thing that you're going to be checking is, of course, the details of the blood that you have received, the batch number, the date of collection, the expiry, the date of expiry, and, uh, of course, the component itself, the blood group that is there and the units that are, have been supplied from the blood bank. Then after you do this, so this is now comparing the patient's details to the blood that has been supplied by the blood bank. So the comment is obviously going to be that this blood is either compatible or it's not compatible. Remember that this takes two people to do. It's not just one person that's ideally supposed to do this, but it's supposed to be two separate healthcare workers that have been trained for this. Then in addition to this, you're going to make sure that the blood has come with uh, a blood transfusion giving set, which has, of course, two filters, and it should be functional. So it should, the blood pack should be inspected for its integrity. It should be complete. It shouldn't be leaking from any way. If it's leaking, you send it back to the lab. The filter, the blood transfusion giving set must have two filters. If it doesn't, send it back to the blood bank. Then after that, you once you've done the compatibility check, you actually make sure that you monitor the vitals every 15 minutes. You monitor them before you start the transfusion every 15 minutes and, of course, after the transfusion. And then if there's any noted changes in the vitals and you stop the transfusion and you manage them accordingly. Then when we receive blood from the blood bank, we pretty much check it for STIs as well as infectious disease screening. So we screen it for HIV, we screen it for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, syphilis, and we screen it for malaria to ensure that none of these bloodborne conditions are transfused from one patient to another. Question two, a patient comes in and he's not breathing. The nurse calls you for an emergency. What are you going to do? Another practical thing. Often when you're in surgery, we're going to be receiving patients that have been involved in an RTA and it's zero two, they have called you, the patient has come in unconscious. What are you going to do? You may pause the video at this moment and here comes the answer. So don't just say ABCs and then that's it expect to get marks in the viva. No, that's not how it works. So you have to explain exactly what you're going to do. So first of all, this is an emergency. So I'm going to check, first of all, the airway of this patient. If there are any dentures in this patient's mouth, I'll remove the dentures. If there is any secretions in the mouth, I'll suction the secretions. I'll position the patient in a recovery position. That's the left lateral decubitus position. But of importance is that you should actually get a cervical collar and make sure that this patient the cervical collar is applied until any cervical pathology has been ruled out or any vertebral pathologies have been ruled out. There are some maneuvers that you can perform to clear the airway, such as the jaw lift and the chin thrust. Have an idea, look these things up uh, on Google and, and see how these maneuvers are done. So you may perform a jaw lift, you may perform a chin thrust that may clear the airway. Then you come to the breathing. You ensure that this patient is breathing spontaneously. If they're not breathing, you may actually call this patient out if they're not responding and try to rub their sternum, rub their eyelids, uh, or actually the eyebrows. Then check their pulse. If the, the heartbeat is, is not present, they're not breathing, then you have to start your chest compressions, your 30 chest compressions with one rescue breath. But of course, if you do not have the empty bag, just the chest compressions themselves are sufficient enough. Then once now you have studied your chest compressions and this person still is not breathing, uh, you can connect them to the oxygen. At this moment, also check their saturations to make sure that the oxygen is actually entering. And if there's, the heart is still not beating and they're still not breathing, you may now give your adrenaline, your one milligram of adrenaline, continue with the chest compressions. Once you've given your adrenaline and you continue with the chest compressions, you now check if there's any hemorrhage anywhere on this patient. Sometimes it may be bleeding. You do a compression test. You compress the, the thorax, you compress the abdomen, you compress the pelvis, and you watch the patient if there's any signs of wincing or anything 
of that sort. You also check the pupils if they're reacting to light. Like I said, we always assume that they're hypoglycemic, so we give them glucose. Empirically, gain venous access, you give this person some dextrose. That may actually save their life. And then, of course, the treatment, the definitive management will depend on what you find on your physical exam. If you find that there's an area that is bleeding, you arrest that area of hemorrhage, give them IV fluids, a blood transfusion. If it's a head injury, of course, you nurse them as per head injury protocols, the elevation of the head end of the bed, if their signs have increased intracranial pressure, things like anisocoria, you may actually give them manitol uh, or one of an osmotic diuretic. They may sometimes require some other surgical procedures to be done in cases of hematomas, intracranial hematomas that may need to be evacuated. Coming to question three, a patient presents with a history of abdominal pain. Take a relevant history. Then after you take the history, you discover that the patient has intestinal obstruction. What investigations are you going to do? So you may pause the video at this moment, and here comes the answer. So whenever it comes to these history-taking questions or history-taking sessions, this is very, very easy. So just imagine that you're taking the history in casualty. Casualty has a lot of people, and imagine the schematics. So you're going to start off with your demographics. What's the name of this patient? What's the age? Because the age is very important, because at a certain age, you're expecting certain things to cause obstruction. For example, someone who's elderly, you're suspecting maybe this could be a malignancy. Then, of course, you do your Socrates, the site of the pain, because the different sites of, on the abdomen mean different things in relation to the pain. So the site, the onset, the character, the radiation, alleviating, exacerbating factors, the timing onset of the pain. Then, of course, any associated symptoms. Are they vomiting? Are they able to pass flatus? When was the last time they opened bowels? Is there yellowing of the eyes? Is there any constipation? Is there obstipation, absolute constipation? Ask for any comorbidities like HIV, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, sickle cell disease, epilepsy, which may affect the outcome of the surgery or may interfere with the type of anesthesia that is being used. Then, of course, ask them if they have any prior surgeries in case of adhesions. Ask them for any history of prior intestinal obstruction and ask them if they take alcohol because this could be sometimes a pancreatitis, which is causing an acute abdomen. Then once you discover that they have intestinal obstruction, you want to ideally do a plain x-ray and erect and a supine. So in the erect, you're going to be seeing your air fluid levels. In the supine, you may see dilatation of the bowel. Then you do an erect x-ray to see if there's any perforation of viscera where you're going to see air under the diaphragm. Then, which is also known as a double diaphragm sign. You may also additionally do an abdominal ultrasound, which may show some dilated loops of bowels. But of course, in our setting, we just use the x-rays to make a diagnosis of intestinal obstruction, marrying it with the clinical picture. Of course, do some blood investigations, a full blood count, to assess if there's any anemia, because this patient may need to go to theater. Electrolytes, urea, creatinine, and liver function tests because this patient may be dehydrated. They lose a lot of fluids and just no obstruction, which may lead to derangement in these lab values. So it's very important to check for them. So question four, how would you classify surgical wounds by contamination? What are the types of wound healing? What factors affect wound healing? So you may pause the video at this moment. And here comes the answer. So we can classify them into four main groups. So we have clean wounds, which have minimal risk of infection. So if you do a procedure which is cutting into a non-inflamed, uh, pretty much sterile place, like a thyroidectomy, a heniorrhy, we consider those as clean wounds that you're going to create. Then if you're cutting into an area where there's low risk of infection, about 10%, and you have maintained the aseptic technique, we call these as clean contaminated wounds. For example, gallbladder surgeries, bowel surgeries, which are not inflamed. Then you have contaminated wounds which have a high risk of infection, about 15 to 30%. This is still cutting into uh, abdominal viscera, a hollow abdominal viscera, so it's in the cases of acute abdomen. Then you may have dirty wounds which have a very high rate of infection, about 40 to 70%. So these are usually these major breach in the aseptic technique. The tissues themselves are infected. So, for example, abscess drainages. So that's how you classify wounds. Then the different types of wound healing, we have healing by primary intention or healing by first intention, which is pretty much when you have a wound, it's usually done with clean wounds. When you have a wound that's created, the edges of the wound are approximated by sutures. Then you have healing by second intention, which is secondary healing 
which is pretty much we do not approximate the edges. We allow to the tissues to heal. This is usually done for wounds that are infected or wounds that are quite large or the edges are too far apart to approximate without causing tension over the wound. So we call that as healing by secondary intention or second intention. Then we have healing by third intention or tertiary wound healing, or we call this as delayed primary closure, where a wound that initially came in infected, we first want to clean the wound, to make sure that it becomes a clean wound, then afterwards we suture it up. So pretty much we don't suture it in the first 24 hours. Then the factors that delay wound healing or affect wound healing are going to be local factors such as infections, poor blood supply, tissue tension, hematomas in the area, large defects, recurring trauma, underlying disease like osteomyelitis and malignancies, or general factors like malnutrition, zinc. Remember that zinc is needed for, of course, collagenase to work, which is one of the important enzymes in wound healing. Then you may also have copper deficiency, which is needed by lysol and uh, one of those things in, of course, wound healing, then you may have some vitamin deficiencies, especially with things like vitamin A and vitamin C, which are also needed by collagenase in the formation of collagen, the maturation of collagen. You may also have things like anemia, malignancies, uremia, diabetes mellitus, immunosuppression, HIV, and steroid use. All these can affect wound healing. Coming to the last question in surgery, it's never a surgical exam if they don't ask you about burns. Just know that. So a 30 kg child comes in with 12% burns. How would you manage this child? Simple and straightforward question. And you may pause the video at this moment. Here comes the answer. So we generally want to admit the child is 12% burns, depending, of, of course, on the degree of the burns. But of course, 12% is quite significant, so you want to admit the child. So we do our ABCs, check that the airway is patent, the patient is breathing, gain venous access, check for any, the, the extent of the, assess the extent of the wound. And then of course, resuscitation of the, uh, resuscitation of fluids. So the volume of fluids that we're going to give, we're going to use our Packland formula. So four mils multiplied by the weight of the child, multiplied by the percentage of the burn. So four multiplied by 30 by 12, that's 1,440 mils. So we're going to be giving half of this in the first eight hours from the time the child was burnt, not from the time when the child came to the hospital, from the time that the child was burnt. Then we give the remaining over 16 hours. So here I'll pose a question to each and every one of you. What happens if the child comes 24 hours after they were burnt? Are you still going to give the resuscitation fluid? How are you going to give it? Or suppose if they come eight hours after they were burnt, how are you going to give the fluid? I want to actually hear your comments in the comment section below. Then afterwards, in the next few days, we generally want to match the IV fluids to the urine output, which with your normal urine output being 0 0.5 to 1 mil per kg per hour. Another trick question that they may ask you is, will you want to transfuse this patient in the first 48 hours? The answer is no, we do not transfuse them because we may run the risk of concentrating their blood because of this systemic inflammatory response that is going on. Daily wound cleaning for the child, high protein diet, and as well as nutritional supplementation. That's all on surgery. We now move and change gears and have a look at pediatrics, chapter three. So question one, what's the difference between sickle cell traits, sickle cell disease, and sickle cell anemia? Part B, what are the types of crisis seen in sickle cell and their pathophysiology? What test will you do to confirm the diagnosis? What picture would you see on the hemogram of a sickle cell patient? You may pause the video right now, and here comes the answer. So remember that sequel cell trait is where they have one abnormal sequel cell gene and one normal adult hemoglobin gene. So it's heterozygosity or heterozygous state. So we do call these people as carriers. So they carry the sequel cell gene with a normal adult hemoglobin gene. Then we may have a sequel cell disease, which is also referred to as combined heterozygosity, where an individual is going to be having one sequel cell, abnormal sequel cell gene, and another abnormal hemoglobin gene, but not necessarily a sequel cell hemoglobin gene. For example, hemoglobin C. Then the sequel cell anemia is pretty much the, the most severe form of the disease where they have two abnormal sequel cell genes. We call this as a homozygous state. So you may have four different types of crises. Some people say five, the fifth one being the mixed type. So you remember SHAVE, S-H-A-V-E, 
S-A-V, without the E. So S for sequestrative crisis, which happens most of the times in the spleen, but can also happen in the liver. So in the spleen, you have this blockage of the outflow of the spleen by these sequel-shaped cells. This is going to be leading to pooling of blood, pooling of platelets, and pretty much pooling of the fluid in the, in the spleen. The spleen will begin to enlarge. This patient may have abdominal distension. They may have abdominal pains. They may, they may be in shock because most of the circulatory volume will remain pooled in the blood. So we call this a splenic sequestration. You may also have hyperhemolytic crisis. The hemolysis can either happen intravascularly because the sequel-shaped red blood cells as they go through the small capillaries can actually be hemolyzed. Or sometimes it can be hypersplenism where the spleen actually rapidly hemolyzes these red blood cells uh, in and removes them from the circulation because they are sequel shaped so both these intravascular and extravascular hemolysis do actually contribute to a hyperhemolytic crisis we may have an aplastic crisis where the erythrovirus b19 previously called the parvovirus b19 actually infects the erythroid progenitor cells and actually reduces the capacity of you to be able to produce these erythrocyte cells. Then you have the vasoclusive crisis, which is triggered. Most of these crises are triggered by certain things, infections, dehydration, emotional changes, like emotional upset, weather, cold weather, exercising, and all these are going to be now leading to trigger dehydration, lead to sickling up of the red blood cells, which can actually lead to blockage of the red blood cells, actually blockage of the blood vessels in different areas, and this may lead to actually pain in the bones it may lead to swelling of the digits which is known as the uh, hand and foot syndrome it's a very common presentation in infants it may also lead to blockage in of blood vessels especially in the lungs leading to an acute chest syndrome then the test that's going to be done to confirm is known as hb electrophoresis remember that a sickling test is not confirmatory of seagull cell anemia but the confirmatory test is HB electrophoresis. That's where they'll actually give you the percentage of the different types of hemoglobin. Then the picture that you would often see, you'd see a normocytic anemia. Remember, iron is not the problem in sickle cell patients. You may see a low hematocrit. You may see an increased white blood cell because there'll be a lot of these uh, erythrocytes and they are counted as white blood cells. And then actually reticulocytes and erythrocytes. So the, the white blood cell can actually be between 12 to 20,000. Don't think that there's an overwhelming infection. It's actually quite a normal thing to see in some sequel cell patients. You may see an increase in the number of platelets as well as an increase in the red cell distribution width. Coming to the second question, a newborn baby presents with fevers, difficulties in feeding, and tachypnea. What is your diagnosis? What are the organisms implicated in neonatal sepsis? Obviously, this is a question that's leading towards neonatal sepsis, so most likely this child has neonatal sepsis. Remember the, de the demarcation, you have early onset neonatal sepsis and late onset neonatal sepsis. But generally, the organisms that are implicated include group B streptococci, Escherichia coli, Listeria monocytogens, Klebsiella species, coagulase negative Staphylococci, Staphylococcus aureus, Acinectobacter, and as well as Pseudomonas. Coming to question three What is pathological jaundice? What differentials would you consider? How would you manage pathological jaundice? You may pause the video at this moment, and here comes the answer. So remember, pathological jaundice is yellowing of the eyes and the skin secondary to pathophysiological causes, often seen on the first day of life. This is in relation to ne neonatal jaundice. Notice how I'm saying this is yellowing of the eyes. I'm not saying pathological jaundice is jaundice. You can't define something with the same thing that you're being asked to define. Jaundice is jaundice. No, it's yellowing of the eyes. So the differentials I will show you in the next slide, but suppose we get a patient with pathological jaundice. This often is going to be managed dependent on the cause, dependent on the gestational age as well as the postnatal age of this child. Generally for unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia or the indirect type of jaundice, we give them phototherapy. Then for those that have rapidly rising levels, we can actually perform an exchange transfusion. We treat the underlying cause. If there's an infection, we treat the infection. Remember that pathological jaundice is largely divided into direct hyperbilirubinemia and indirect. So pretty much you have your um, obstructive versus your non-obstructive type of jaundice. So here are the differentials for the, the indirect versus the direct so you can actually pause the video at this moment and actually get a screenshot of this you should be able to actually list just 10 of these if you know 10 of these by the time you reach the fifth cause they would have already asked you to proceed to the next question so take a picture of this 
Question 4. A 21-year-old baby develops jaundice. How? 21-week, rather, old baby develops jaundice. How do you classify jaundice? What are the differentials in this case? So that 21 weeks. And here comes the answer. So you can divide it as pathological versus physiological. You may have obstructive versus non-obstructive. You may have prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic. The different causes, if it's direct or conjugated type of hyperbilirubinemia, you can have cholidococysts, cystic fibrosis, metabolic disorders like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiencies, the hereditary fructose intolerance, neonatal hepatitis, which could be due to hepatitis A, B, E, torch infections, varicella, herpes, tuberculosis, or indirect hyperbilirubinemia, Crigland and Jarre syndrome, where you have a deficiency in glucuronyl S transferase enzyme, spherocytosis and liptocytosis, pyruvate kinase deficiency, and glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Another possible question that they may ask you is how does the phototherapy machine work? So please have a look at that. Stay tuned in the next episode, season two, actually season one, episode two, where we will talk about these things. Question five, and the last question on pediatrics, define prematurity. A child is born at 28 weeks of gestation with difficulty breathing. What are your differentials? How would you keep the child warm? You may pause the video at this moment, and here comes the answer. So remember that a baby that's born at 37, before 37 weeks is termed as premature. You can also refer to them as preemies. You can refer to them as premature children or prematurity. So those that are born between the 34th to 37th week, you call that as late preterm, high chance of survival. Those that are born from 32 to 34, that's moderate preterm, intermediate chance of survival. 32 to 28 weeks, very preterm. There's, in a well-developed country, there's a very high chance of survival. In an underdeveloped country, it's a very low chance of survival. Then those that are less than 28, extreme preterm, these ones even in developed countries have a very minimal chance of actually um, surviving. But most of them actually once treated quite well, some of them actually do very well and grow up and uh, live a normal life. So a child that's born at 28 weeks and difficulty breathing, you should consider respiratory distress syndrome or hyaline membrane disease. Apnea of prematurity, it sometimes could be a pneumothorax, sometimes even an, a pneumonia in the background of sepsis then you ideally want to keep them warm with an incubator, which is at an ideal temperature, but you should make sure that you constantly monitor this child's temperature, their hydration status, and make sure that the, the child actually is um, having contact with the parents and they're encouraged to actually participate in the care of the child through the kangaroo mother care. Another thing to take note of is remember the five stages of lung development in a child. There's a mnemonic, every premature child takes air. Embryonic stage, which is three to eight weeks. Pseudoglandular stage, which is five to 16 weeks. Canalicular stage, which is 16 weeks to 26 weeks. Terminal cycular stage, which is 26 weeks to 37. Alveolar stage, which is from birth until the child is in early childhood, which is eight years. Now coming to the last chapter of this episode, which is chapter four, obstetrics and gynecology. Question one. PPH is one cause of maternal death in the country. Define PPH. What are the causes? How would you manage uterine atony? You may pause the video at this moment, and here comes the answer. So remember that there are many different definitions of PPH that you would actually receive. But in this case, we're talking about primary postpartum hemorrhage. There is a secondary postpartum hemorrhage. The difference is this. Primary it means that it's happening within 24 hours of delivery in the of course the, the third stage of labor while it's secondary is happening after 24 hours of delivery so the ideal definition that you have in your textbook is the blood loss that is greater than 500 mils after a vaginal delivery a thousand mils after a c-section 1500 after a cesarean hysterectomy but this definition is not ideal because some people tend to overestimate the blood loss some tend to underestimate the blood loss then you may also have another definition, which is a fall in hemoglobin greater than 10%, but this is not ideal because it's going to be taking quite a long time to actually manifest in a patient. By the time you actually discover this, the patient has actually even died. Then an ideal definition or a clinical definition is pretty much any significant blood loss at the t after the delivery 
that makes the patient symptomatic. So features of fatigue, lightheadedness, confusion, sweating, pallor, or results in features of hypovolemia, a low blood pressure, a rapid heart rate, a decrease in urinary output. This is actually a very, very practical definition of PPH. But of course, you're going to be giving all three definitions. You will be seemed like to be knowledgeable in actually reading a lot of content. So causes can be divided into uterine tone, things like multiple gestation, polyhydramnios and macrosomia, which cause over distension of the uterus, rapid and prolonged labor, which overwork the uterus, chorioamnionitis, grand multiparity, use of tocolytics, uterine trauma, such as lacerations, hematomas, uterine invasion, uterine rupture. Tissues that are retained, such as placenta, Attachment disorders, remember your placenta accreta, percreta, and increta may also have accessory lobe of the placenta. You may sometimes have retained products of conception, which is the RPOCs. Then you may have thrombosis, things like hemophilia, use of anticoagulant drugs, inherited clotting factor deficiencies. So if you discover that there's uterine atony, you want to perform vigorous uterine massage, express any clots that are there. You can actually give methagene 0.2 milligrams IV slowly, avoid this in hypertensive patients, you would ideally give them oxytocin. So 10 international units in 500 mils of normal saline to run at 40 to 60 drops per minute. Then if the bleeding still persists, we explore the uterus, we examine the placenta to check for the cotyledons, we examine the membranes to see if they're intact, to see if there's any missing pieces of the membrane or the placenta, which can indicate retained uh, products of conception inside the uterus. Then continue with blood transfusion and the oxytocin drip. If the bleeding still doesn't stop, we give the misoprostol 600 micrograms orally or 800 micrograms sublingual or 1,000 micrograms perectally as a single dose or an injection of uh, prostaglandin, which is 15 methyl prostaglandin F2 alpha, 250 micrograms IM. But remember that this is contraindicated in asthmatic patients. If it's due to tocolytics, we can give them calcium gluconate, one gram IV slowly to neutralize the calcium blocking effects of the drugs. Then of course, if bleeding still persists, then the uterine massage coupled with the bimanual compression of the uterus can be done as you await to take this patient to theater. You may actually contemplate using an intrauterine balloon tamponade, which is a four-lace catheter that you inflate with 200 to 500 mils of fluid or a condom that's kept inside for about 46 hours. If all these steps fail, then you have to take the patient to theater where they actually can ligate the uterine artery. If this fails, they can perform a hysterectomy. So as you're waiting to take them to theater, you can do the bimanual uterine compression. So in theater, they're going to perform a C-section and they're going to actually use a B-Lynch suture. Then what question, the next question is Yon Ko at Levi Manawasa University Teaching Hospital in around 02. The police bring in a girl that has allegedly been raped. What are you going to do? What investigations will you order? How will you manage this person? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So remember this is a rape case. So this is a potentially legal case. So you want to take a history of the events. So the demographics data of the victim, the demographic data of the police officer. So the name of the police officer, the badge number, the date where you're taking this history, the examination, the date time and of the examination, because all these things are very important in court. Then of course the history of whatever happened, the time and the place of the rape event, was any penetration, what type of rape was it? Was it oral, vaginal, rectal? Did they use a condom? Did they ejaculate in this person? Did they use any weapons? Is there any bleeding? Then of course the HIV status of the victim, any comorbidities or any injuries that may have been incurred. Then the last menstrual period of this patient, the last date where they had coitus prior to them being raped, do they use any contraceptives? And what was done after they were raped? Did they brush their teeth? Did they go bath? Did they douche themselves? Then of course, physical examination. You should note any genitalia and extra genitalia injuries perform a psychological evaluation, and of course, collect the evidence for the forensics. So the investigations you're going to do, of course, your swabs of the cervix, the vagina, the rectum, the mouth, and the thighs. Obviously, you're doing this for DNA analysis. The semen is taken for DNA analysis. Then, of course, the presence of semen is actually an indication that the patient was raped, especially if it's on the inside. If it's not on the uh, vulva alone, but also on the inside, it's evidence enough in court. Then the... Hair samples that are adhering to the nails, you can take nail clippings, you can take samples of hair from the clothes, even from the skin of the patient, you take this for DNA analysis. Do take some blood tests for an HIV test because this patient is going to need 
prophylaxis if they're HIV negative, the post-exposure prophylaxis. Then screen for syphilis, hepatitis B, perform a gravindex test to ensure that this patient already wasn't pregnant prior to them being raped. Then of course, a vaginal and urine culture, microscopy and sensitivity to rule out gonorrhea and chlamydia. And of course, urine toxicology if this patient is not really in a conscious state because they may have been drugged. Then how do we manage this? So we give them prophylactic treatment for sexually transmitted infections. So ceftriaxone 500 milligrams IM as a single dose or one gram if they're over 150 kilograms. This covers against gonorrhea or chlamydia. Alternatively, you can give them doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days for against chlamydia. Metronidazole 500 milligrams orally three times a day for seven days for trichomoniasis and bacterial vaginosis. If they, were, if they are vaccinated against hepatitis B, you can give them boosters at one and six months. Give them post-exposure prophylaxis, that's your HIV drugs to prevent HIV. And of course, give them emergency contraception. These are usually effective if their patient has reported to the hospital within 48 hours. And very, very important, actually do offer this patient some psychological support and psychological counseling. Then if the patient actually seeks advice before medical evaluation, this is just general for every single patient. Spread this information. They should not throw away or change their clothing before they report to the police station, before they report to the hospital. They should not wash themselves. They should not shower. They should not douche. They should not even brush their teeth. They should not even clip their fingernails or use any mouthwash because once you do this, you're destroying the evidence that is there. Then, of course, another thing that's very important in the history, you should ask the patient if they're familiar with the person that raped them or if they don't know the person. Then we do also do some follow-up tests that after one week for gonorrhea, chlamydia infection, and trichomoniasis in patients who refuse the prophylactic treatment. At two weeks, we do a pregnancy test. At four to six weeks, we test for syphilis and HIV. Then after three months, we test for syphilis, hepatitis, as well as HIV infection. Question three. Classify hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. How would you manage severe preeclampsia? You may pause the video at this moment, and here comes the answer. So remember that hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, the benchmark is 20 weeks. You have some that occur before 20 weeks, those that occur after 20 weeks. So gestational hypertension, which was previously known as non-proteinuric pregnancy-induced hypertension, this is a high BP, greater than 140 over 90, on four to six hours apart, after 20 weeks of pregnancy, but without proteinuria. Then you may have preeclampsia and eclampsia, which is after 20 weeks, the same high BP, greater than four to six hours, but they do have proteinuria. The difference between preeclampsia and eclampsia is that in preeclampsia, there are no seizures. In eclampsia, there are seizures. Then chronic hypertension, which is preexisting, so they had this uh, pressure before the 20 weeks of gestation, probably even before they got pregnant. You may sometimes have superimposed preeclampsia and eclampsia on a chronic hypertensive patients. So these are the four different types of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. So remember that the management of severe preeclampsia is ideally the same management as with preeclampsia. So we generally want to admit the patient, we control their BP. We can use hydralazine or labetalol. Then if we're using hydralazine 5 to 10 milligrams every 15 to 60 minutes until the diastolic blood pressure is less than 160 over 110, your maximum dose is 30 milligrams. Then labetalo 10 to 20 milligrams IV every 10 minutes until the BP is less than 160 over 10, your maximum dose is 300 milligrams. Remember labetalo is given slowly over one to two minutes because it tends to drop the BP very quickly. If their BP is still high, regardless of you giving them the, the hydralazine, you can give them an ifedipine sublingual dose, 10 milligrams. Then once the BP is controlled, and ideally we can transition them to the orals, methyl dopa, 250 to 500 milligrams orally, three times a day or four times a day, or nifedipine, 10 to 20 milligrams orally, twice a day. Remember that ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers are contraindicated in pregnancy. Then prophylactic uh, magnesium sulfate can be given. We use the, the regimen that's using IV and IM. So we give a loading dose of 14 grams. Four gram is given as IV. This should be, of course, your reduced dosage, the diluted uh, type. It's given over three to five minutes. Then 10 grams is given as deep IM, which is with the undiluted dose. So we give five grams in each buttock. Then the maintenance dose is five grams every four hourly in the alternate uh, buttock. Then of course, this is given until 24 hours after delivery or the last seizure, whichever occurs first. Definitive management of severe preeclampsia is of course delivery. 
So if they're preterm, give them corticosteroids, dexamethasone, 6 milligrams IM every 12 hours for four doses. And the mode of delivery is largely dependent on the, if there is any contraindication to vaginal delivery, you deliver them by C-section. And if the bishop score is favorable for a vaginal delivery, ideally a bishop score greater than 7 will be favorable for a vaginal delivery. Then if there's any pulmonary edema, we treat them with furosemide and we monitor their urine output. Coming to question four, what are the different types of abortion that you know? What investigations would you order for someone with an abortion? How would you manage septic abortion? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So there are different types of abortion, threatened abortions, inevitable abortions, uh, incomplete abortion, complete abortion, missed abortion, septic abortion. Let me just give you an overview of them. So threatened abortion, the cervical ostium is closed. They just have bleeding and minimal abdominal pain. So it's threatening to abort the pregnancy. Then inevitable abortion, their cervix or their cervical os is open. They are bleeding. There is worsening abdominal pain. So it's inevitable. It's bound to happen. In complete abortion, they may have history of passing some clots, history of passing some products of conception. The pain is still there. It's quite significant, the abdominal pain, and they may be bleeding. Complete abortion, the os is closed. There may be minimal or very little bleeding, and of course, the abdominal pain may be reducing or may have even been gone. With the missed abortion, even the signs of pregnancy would have been gone. Septic abortion is one that's infected, so they may have features of systemic infections like fever, as well as maternal tachycardia. Then investigations would do a full blood count to check for any infections. ABO and RH grouping. RH grouping is very, very important because if this person was RH negative, we want to give the anti-D antibodies, that's the Rogam, to prevent erythroblastosis fatalis in the future. Then, of course, get an abdominal ultrasound to confirm the products that are present inside the uterus. Then serial beta HCG levels can be done. Uh, serum progesterone levels can be done as well. Blood cultures in cases of septic abortion, endocervical, as well as high vaginal swabs can be done in septic abortions. And then, of course, karyotyping and histopathology of the tissues that you have gotten, for, for example, if you are performing an MVA to clear out an incomplete abortion. And then once you get a septic abortion, ideally you admit them, resuscitate them with IV fluids, and if they need blood transfusion, we transfuse them with blood monitor their vitals and their urine output, give them IV antibiotics, preferably eight hours before the manual vacuum aspiration procedure, which should be then continued for 14 days. So we give them ideally ampicillin, 500 milligrams IV three times a day, gentamicin, 80 milligrams IV three times a day, metronidazole, 500 milligrams IV three times a day. Remember with gentamicin, you should continuously monitor the urine uh, output. You should consider monitoring their renal function tests. Then, of course, the MVA must be done ideally by an experienced doctor and it should be done ideally in theater because there's a risk of perforation, there's a risk of these patients actually bleeding out. So we give egometrin at, on admission, about 0 0.5 milligrams IM on admission. It helps with contraction of the uterus and lowers the chance of actually perforating. But, of course, this should be avoided in hypertensive patients. Give oxytocin instead. So here's just the schematic that I got from... In one of the textbooks. So here you have abortions being classified as spontaneous, which are the miscarriages or induced. Those that are induced can either be legal, medical termination of pregnancy, which is under, for example, if there is a very serious birth deformity or the mother's health status is jeopardized by the pregnancy. Then unsafe is the illegal type, which often lead to septic. Then the spontaneous can either be isolated or sporadic, or they may be recurrent, which are the types we talked about. Threatened, inevitable, complete, incomplete, missed, and septic abortion. Coming to the last question, it's never an obstetrics and gynecology uh, OSCE exam if they don't bring your instruments. So identify the following instruments, A, B, C, D, and E. You may pause the video, scream your answers at your screen. I know you've seen these on the words, and here comes the answer. So A, this one here is a curette. This here is a uterine sound. This is an umbilical cord scissors. This is an episiotomy scissors, and this is a ventus cup. I really hope you enjoyed this pilot episode of The Atomic Bomb. If you did, consider subscribing. Post in the comments below that you want more of such contents, and we would actually release a lot of contents coming up on the channel sorry for the silence once again i am back in full force if you haven't yet subscribed please subscribe to the channel what are you waiting for we're on the road to 
4K subscribers. My name is Dr. Moses Kazebu. We leave no one behind to Zambia and beyond. Until next time, bye-bye.